Okay, this video is about sustaining biodiversity. And in particular, it's uh, the approach where they focus on saving the species themselves. So we start off by talking about a species that has become extinct. That's the passenger pigeon. And uh, the idea was that there were billions of passenger pigeons and we hunted them to extinction. So there are uh, no more passenger pigeons left. Very interesting, uh, the terminology here, the stool pigeon. Apparently a dead and stuffed passenger pigeon would uh, attract live passenger pigeons that could then be killed. So they would put them on a stool, and that was the stool pigeon, where that terminology has come from. So extinctions happen uh, anyway, and we've talked about background extinction before. Um, and now we're also talking about the idea that there have been periods where there have been mass extinctions. Uh, the dinosaurs was an example of that. Ice Age is coming as an example of that. And the question is, are we in a mass extinction now that has human causes to it? So there's the passenger pigeon now extinct on the planet. Okay, so uh, we are doing things that are cutting down on the biodiversity, and a big part of it is what we talked about in the last chapter, that we have been filling in the wetlands. We've also been turning croplands with lots of diversity into crop fields that have a little diversity and also developing to the extent of cities and of course that takes out all the habitats that were there before. So background extinction is the idea that there are extinctions that are naturally happen happening and have happened all along and then the um, a question is, you know, what happens when these mass extinction comes in? So it's a little hard to figure out exactly what's going on or has gone on in the past because of fossil uh, records and also because we're not even sure. Some species exist in a very small area, so we may be wiping them out right now uh, before we even knew they were there. So that's uh, an interesting situation there. So local extinction is where the species is no longer in an area that it was before. Ecological extinction is where it can no longer uh, keep its role in the its niche. It can no longer keep its role in the ecosystem. And biological extinction is they are gone. Okay, so um, we are causing premature extinctions, uh, and uh, you know we can go back to HIPCO to talk about these things again, and habitat destruction and overhunting are some of the reasons we've done that, or some of the ways we've done that. And overhunting would be the example for the, for the passenger pigeon. Okay, so here are some species that are no longer with us uh, very recently, the golden toad in Madagascar, and uh, so they are gone. And uh, that has something to do with people, gone since people have made uh, an impact here. Okay, so we are now talking about the idea with the species approach of identifying species that are in trouble. So there are varying degrees in identifying these species, and endangered uh, is the highest level, I guess. We're thinking we're pretty close to extinction there, and threatened is a little bit farther, uh, you know, not as far along, uh, but they are threatened, and if things don't turn around, they can become endangered. We have, since we've become aware of this, been able to turn around in some dramatic fashion some of these situations. And uh, there's been some real success stories along with some that uh, are more like the passenger pigeon. Okay, uh, I'm going to go back to this uh, characteristics here for a second. So some of the characteristics are going to be that they exist in a small area, uh, endemic species where they are in a small area and only have a small amount of uh, different uh, foods that they could have, let's say, or a small range of things that are going to keep them alive, and uh, that's going to be the characteristics of endangered and threatened species in, in a lot of ways. Here are endangered species, and get a good look at those, and that's in your textbook as well. And uh, yes, again, these are the characteristics. They don't produce uh, very regularly, so uh, low, or low reproductive rates, uh, specialized niche, so if it's threatened, they are in trouble, and there aren't a lot of them. That could be a problem as well, and higher up on the trophic level. So if there is a problem on the food chain, then uh, it's going to make work its way up to the species at the higher trophic level first, and they need a lot of uh, mass to keep uh, one one top feeder going. 
migratory patterns that we've interrupted, maybe they're rare, and if they are commercially uh, valuable as well, that could be another problem for them. Um, large territories, they need a large territory to roam and we're degrading their territories, that could be uh, the problem as well. So there are some examples there, and this gives you an idea of um, species that and how they're threatened with premature extinction. Extinction that would not be background extinction, extinction that we are causing. Okay, really again, as I said before, hard to figure out exactly what's going on with this. Um, you know, we don't have a fossil record that is uh, complete, and we have only identified some of the species that we're talking about. So, there we go. And uh, here's a good rule of thumb here that you will, with 90% loss of the habitat, lose 50% of the species in there. So, we have mathematical models that can determine what's going on, but... Uh, hard to predict exactly what's happening. Although with data collection techniques and the technology that we have, we are able to keep a better inventory on, uh, on the species on the planet than we were before. Okay, so why are we pre uh, preserving these species anyway? What is the, is the benefit in that? Well, one of them is the idea of things that we can get from them. The uh, tourism industry is a pretty good one, that's one thing. And maybe the information about those species can help us to figure out what we're doing for ourselves. And uh, I'll have some examples of that on some slides that are coming up. And then really it depends on your outlook on the world as well. Do you think that the species have a right to exist? Or do you think that uh, you know we have a right to do what we want on the planet? And the aesthetic value is maybe there's some beauty in it to some people, so we might want to preserve them. And the other thing is we might be thinking of the idea of what goes on after we're gone. Do we want to have these things available to our children and our children's children's children? And uh, then, of course, the other thing is what do they do in the food chain? What do they do in the uh, ecosystem? What's their role in the ecosystem? What, uh, what would happen if they were gone? And we've talked about how uh, each part of the ecosystem has its own important role. So that's a problem as well. And here are some orangutans, very cute. And they are endangered in a tropical forest. Okay, so here's a, uh, an idea of, like I said, where we can talk about some things that we can benefit directly from these species. And many of the pharmaceutical uh, products that we have right now come from things that we found in the natural world, and then we've been able to replicate them in a lab. So uh, these plants uh, could help us out. And if we get rid of the areas that they live in before we find out what they're good for or we've analyzed them, then perhaps we're losing something that could have been uh, beneficial to us. Okay, and this is the idea of the aesthetic value. Uh, some people would argue that that's a beautiful bird and has a right to exist, and um, but that's tough if you're taking their habitats away. Okay, so elephants are an issue right now. Right now, actually, there's a, uh, a story in 2017, where we are right now, about the idea of elephants and allowing some uh, ivory from elephants to come back into the country, which we had banned before. Um, but the, um, there's a trade here, exotic uh, trade with, um, you know, with um, the tusks of rhinoceroses, the tusks of elephants, and this leads to the killing because there's money to be made in it. So this was an international treaty, uh, but uh, there's still a there's still a problem going on in here. Um, we know we don't have elephants running around here in New Jersey, but we do have deer running around, and a lot of deer, and uh, also bear in New Jersey. And sometimes we get the idea that we should be clearing out the um, the herd, as it were, because there's just maybe too many of them to be in our area. You know, we're running into uh, deer on the road, and that's happening all the time. So they allow hunts to get rid of the deer, and they allow hunts to get rid of the uh, bear as well in New Jersey, or they have recently. And uh, that's the question in Africa. There's some areas where these elephants are... Um, you know, dangerously close to people and can cause some damage. And cold is a word for thinning of the herd, and that would be by human intervention, by hunting. So should that be allowed in some areas? Um, so yeah, we're, I guess the DNA here thing is talking about they're going to try to narrow down where the elephant tusks came from, and if they're coming from areas that illegal poaching is going on, then uh, they're going to take that into account and uh, try to keep people from doing that. Very difficult to do. 
Okay, so how about bats? Why should we care about bats? Well, um, bats are good for pollination. That's one thing. They uh, take out a lot of the insects that we consider pests, so that's a pretty good thing. Uh, by eating fruit, they are uh, transmitting the seeds from one way to another. And uh, so there's a, a deal on may maybe why we should, uh, should save the bats. Bats kind of like sharks are things that people are a little bit afraid of, so sometimes they don't want to protect them. But uh, bats are, are pretty useful for us. Uh, around in New Jersey, a lot of the places that I go walking, they now have uh, bat homes that they put up that the uh, bats can hang around in, and I guess literally hang around in when they hang, hang upside down, and trying to encourage bats to be um, around, because we would kind of like to have them around. Okay, so here comes the acronym that talks about how we're getting rid of species as human beings, and that's the famous HIPCO, of course. So it's good to know that in order of devastation toward um, uh, species, that habitat destruction, invasive uh, species that we've added into their environment, uh, population and resource growth, which is our human population growing, the pollution that we've created, climate change, and overexploitation, which is uh, overhunting is another way of saying that. <clears throat> Overexploitation of things like trees or overhunting of animals. And that is the acronym. Uh, a lot of your uh, connections that you make can go through this HIPCO if you really understand the ins and outs of it. Okay, so these are the things that we've been doing. This is basically HIPCO in a different chart form here. Um, so I'll kind of move on from there. But uh, yes, this is HIPCO in a chart form. And this just gives you an idea of what we've done to some of these animals. The Indian tiger had a wider range in the past than it did before, and uh, we're cutting down on its range. The black rhinoceros as well, and uh, the African elephant. So these are just uh, some ideas of what we have done uh, for these species. And, well, you know, it's a cost-benefit there for us as well because the human race is expanding, and we're going to just get the priorities figured out and figure out how, when, and if we can all live in harmony here. Okay, so birds. Birds are uh, interesting indicator species to figure out what's going on. So we have changed their habitats, changed their uh, what's going on for them by their farming, and putting in roads and developing areas. So we have cut down on their habitats. Uh, I've done that in my own yard, taken down some bushes, and I know that that gave the birds less places to be. Um, and uh, non-native or uh, invasive species can also be a problem uh, for the birds. So when the uh, uh, birds are starting to have problems, it's an indicator maybe that the entire ecosystem is having a little bit of a problem because once it starts being unable to support the birds, uh, there will probably be other species that will follow in that direction. Okay, so we've done a lot of these things directly to them, so you can see the idea uh, birds that are... Uh, around fishing equipment are in trouble and we've all seen pictures of oil spills where the birds are covered and uh, we've done things with the DDT that we'll talk about uh, in other chapters and uh, pesticides and herbicides that are very good um, for doing what we wanted them to do but there were these unintended consequences and the birds got uh, caught up in that one. A very famous book is the Rachel Carson Silent Spring where we couldn't hear the birds anymore. Uh, lead in shotgun pellets is a good one, and I'm going to talk about that on a later slide as well. Okay, so uh, we also have the idea here that climate change is uh, is a problem, and that is changing uh, what can live in different places and uh, changing a lot of things here as well. And that is the study of the birds in a nutshell. So here's some birds that are endangered now, <clears throat> and uh, so you can get a look at them. Okay, so um, the idea of invasive species, not all of this is the species just coming in where they weren't wanted on their own. In some places, we have introduced ones that are going to help out. And uh, the horse in, in, uh, in uh, North America is an example of that one. So there are things that we've done for uh, that are beneficial to us, and we're happy about that one. Uh, the problem is when you have species that are introduced to a new area, they might not have predators. They might not have competitors or parasites or pathogens, and they may outcompete the species that were there orig originally. And, uh, and that can mean that the species that were there and had a role in the ecosystem can no longer do what they were there to do. And that changes the ecosystems dramatically. 
Okay, so here are some species that we deliberately introduced for one reason or another. I know the purple loosestrife is a is one up in the Great Lakes area that's causing a lot of problem because they just can't seem to get rid of it. And there are some stories that we'll talk about with these invasive species in class as well. And here are some species that were accidentally introduced. And uh, we've talked about a few of these in class as well. And uh, the zebra mussel was actually a free response question a few years uh, back. Uh, they come in, the, in uh, the ballast water of ships. And the ballast water is the water that the ship uses to keep itself uh, upright in the water. So there's actually some water inside there. And the zebra mussels attached uh, themselves. And then they got into new areas uh, because of that. So since then, there have been some different ways to, uh, to keep that from happening. Okay, the kutsu vine. Now, I don't know. This is a vine that came from Japan, but i got to follow up on this story. I've been hearing some things about the uh, kutsu vine uh, recently, and I have to follow up on that. I, don't, I think it may have been a, there may have been a way of turning it back, but I, there'll be more on that story later. But the idea is this vine takes over, and it's hard to get rid of. I've tried to keep up with the weeds in my yard, and I know if I, if I didn't, I think it would take over my house like that at some point or another. All right, so um, the ants here were a problem here. So we, the uh, ants from Argentina, that um, the pesticides got rid of there. Uh, they were not affected by the pesticides, so that got, uh, and it got rid of things that would be getting rid of the fire ants. So there were just way too many fire ants. And we have talked about the Burmese python being as a pet released into the Everglades, and they're hard to get rid of uh, as well, big Burmese pythons in the Everglades. Okay, so this was the idea of the fire ants and how they were accidentally introduced and they are really taken over in that area. Okay, so keeping it from happening is the best idea of doing things, the precautionary principle of, uh, at work, of course, and then uh, once it's already happened, then you know we have to really, really go out of our way to get uh, rid of them. So we're going to look for uh, understanding the species a little bit more, understanding how to get rid of them, uh, what, uh, what is going to work in that respect. And that's the idea of getting rid of the invasive species. But it is very costly and, uh, and very hard to do. Okay, so here you can uh, recommend, uh, uh, you know, you can uh, probably think here about the idea of the characteristics that are going to be good for invas invader species and uh, what's going to make a ecosystem vulnerable. If the ecosystem is similar to the habitat, it can be successful, but it doesn't have predators, and um, that's, uh, that's a good setup for invaders, invadive, invader species to do well. And these are the kind of species that do well. Generalists, high genetic variability, so there'll be, um, you know, differential reproduction based on what trait is going to be successful in the new environment. And if they are, are selected where they are turning over their species regularly, they're going to have a better shot at that as well. Okay, so what can you do? Lots of things you can do. I know when we go camping, we talk about things that don't bring firewood from other places to a new place. That's one thing that we do. Even talk about the idea of riding on your bicycle, clean off all the mud on your bicycle because you're going to be taking things with you that are uh, from one place maybe to another if you go uh, camping or traveling. Um, so, yeah, let's see what else they have here. Oh, the firewood, uh, unused bait. Okay, brush the dogs off. The dogs could be taking things home with them. There's the mountain bike. Yeah, don't dump the wild things into the, into the, uh, don't dump the contents of your aquarium into the waterways. I think that might have been the Burmese python problem. So we can do things about this. Okay, so these are some of the other ways that we are causing species to become extinct. And uh, we've already discussed those with HIPCO, and I think we're all aware of those in some detail. Here's a story of DDT, and DDT was a pesticide. So this was used to help crops, um, and it was very effective, uh, got rid of some pests. Um, but the problem was the DDT also got into the shells of birds, 
and uh, didn't kill the birds outright, but made the shells degraded and the birds couldn't hatch. And we found out that there were some unintended consequences of this DDT. So it was very good for what they were doing, getting rid of mosquitoes and all of that. Um, but this brings in the topics of bioaccumulation and biomagnification. The idea of bioaccumulation, or biomagnification rather, is what this is showing, is that this is how it moves its way up in the food chain. So here's an osprey, which is a, a bird of prey that's by the water, kind of like a seahawk, if you will. And uh, the, they're high up on the food chain. But this um, DDT, and it works for a lot of other things as well, is fat-soluble and it doesn't go away. It stays in the system. Of the, uh, of the organism that gets it into its system. So when you're talking about uh, in the water, very small parts per million, but as it moves up its food chain, it never goes away. And you remember that each step up the food chain, you're eating all of the DDT that uh, the individuals had in them. But as you go up the food chain, you have to eat more and more of the individuals. So if the zooplankton had a little bit of the DDT, the minnows are going to eat, uh, every time they eat it, they're going to get all of that DDT in their system and it doesn't go away. So when a larger fish eats them, it gets all of their DDT, but it has to eat a lot of those fish. It isn't eating just one. And that's the bioaccumulation as it goes up the food chain. Biomagnification, which is also related to this, is inside of the individual. So the individual will accumulate more and more during their lifetime, and then it magnifies as it goes up the food chain. Okay, so honeybees are another thing that we are concerned with. They are big pollinators for us, and in recent years we've been seeing that there's been a drop-off in the uh, population of the honeybees. And Albert Einstein is famously quoted as saying, when the honeybees go, the humans go as well. So it seems like we would uh, want to keep the honeybees away, and we're still trying to figure out what we have done, or what has happened that has caused a collapse in the honeybees population. So there are some theories out there, and they don't know exactly. Okay, so here's a uh, polar bear with, uh, with the sea. And um, I guess with the polar bears, the big thing about them is the climate change. So uh, that's affecting their ability to stay around. And here's another thing, and this is about the over-exploitation um, over and uh, what we're doing here for um, species and, uh, in, in, in ways that are unsustainable, I guess, to keep them alive in there. So we are taking animals and pets, uh, animals and plants, and we're uh, picking up on them, and we are maybe uh, uh, taking them where we shouldn't, and maybe getting rid of more of them than we should. And there are some pretty graphic pictures coming up, so I will warn you about that. You might want to look away. Um, but here is a rhinoceros killed for its tusk, and the entire animal is now dead and they take the uh, tusk along, and uh, so. We can find out about these different species. People can make a difference. So Jane Goodall is pretty famous for trying to understand what's going on with chimpanzees and uh, kind of understand what the animals are all about. And the understanding of them may help with the uh, preservation, and maybe we can uh, discourage some of the killing that goes on if that's important to us. There's been more and more development. So, um, you know, people, poorer people that are living particularly near, near forests are forced to go after different kinds of meat than they have in the past. And um, we, the hunters there are uh, hunting a lot of these species to ex uh, extinction. And there's another graphic picture coming up. And uh, that's the uh, gorillas that they're now using as food where they hadn't before. And then, uh, and bushmeat is problematic, I guess, here if you want the gorillas to be alive and uh, to stick around. Okay, so we have done some things. Uh, the people in the world have done some things to uh, try to cut down on some of this stuff. So here is an international treaty that is to cut down on the trade of endangered species. And uh, that was uh, the CITES, C-I-T-E-S, uh, so many acronyms to get figured out here. And uh, here's another one that was uh, ratified by 190 countries, but the U.S. stayed out of that one um, for probably economical uh, reasons. 
Okay, the endangered species is a good one for the United States. So we have um, come up with this act to protect some of the species. So there are rules and penalties for doing things that will damage those species. We've had a real comeback of the uh, bald eagle here in New Jersey. We have bunches of nesting pairs where we were uh, down to not too many. And uh, they make the people stay a certain distance away from them. And there are big penalties if you were to kill one. And uh, so, but this is a, a, a piece of legislation that has gone back and forth over the years. Sometimes it gets stronger, sometimes it's weakened. We have to decide if animals are going to be, if species are going to be moved off the endangered species list. This will change what can happen with them. And um, so it's, it's an ongoing thing here. And uh, no, no one answer has been found here that's going to stick. It's, it's going to be a shifting thing. And that has a lot to do with politics and worldviews and all of that. One of the things that uh, people are talking about is hot spots, and they have identified areas where there are lots of endangered species living. And the idea is that they'll protect this area, these hot spots, um, and try to preserve the area itself so that the species that are there and are endangered are going to have a place to, a safe place to be. Of course, if these are areas that are good for development or have resources, then there's going to be a conflict in that, and that'll be an ongoing debate. Okay, so uh, this, uh, this piece of legislation has been changed many times over the years, and lots of people want to do lots of different things to it, and it seems that every time there are new people in office, uh, it's going to be up for debate. Um, here are some uh, endangered species that have been turned into products that people like to buy, and uh, so there have been laws against doing that, and hopefully that will cut down on... on uh, on some of the endangered species being killed, um, but it's really hard to do that when there's a profit to be made. There has to be there's some kind of question on profits over aesthetic value, maybe. And these are interesting questions. Okay, so um, these are some things that we've done with the uh, Endangered Species Act, and um, so it's. Um, yeah, and I showed you the red list in class, and the red list shows uh, what's going on right now with the species that are endangered, and uh, so these are some of the limitations of the Endangered Species Act, and, um, and there you go. Um, so uh, there are things that are being suggested to do to the Endangered Species Act, and like I said, this is an ongoing uh, process. Um, so, another thing that we have done is uh, got protected areas. We have an amazing national park uh, system going on in this United States. Theodore Ro Roosevelt was a big one for uh, getting a lot of areas uh, preserved as wildlife refuges so the development wouldn't happen or would be very minimal. And um, so this seems to be a good thing um, for the species, but a bad thing for the economic uh, things that we're leaving on the table by staying off of certain lands. What else can we do? Another thing when it comes to plants is we have a seed bank that has seeds from all the plants that we could possibly imagine. There's one located in Iceland, and that is good for preserving um, the seeds just in case we need them. So if we run out of them in nature, we have a bank. Yeah, some, there's some debate on whether those seeds are still going to be viable and for how long, but it's certainly a good idea. Botanical gardens are another way of doing it. We have zoos that we're talking about as well. And uh, so there you go. These are different ways that we can do that. Zoos and aquariums, as I said, um, that becomes controversial as well. Sometimes people don't like the way the animals are kept. Um, and uh, very recently, the idea of these aquariums have come under scrutiny as far as keeping whales. Um, so these are different things that we're doing. Um, captive breeding, that's a good one to be thinking of, the California condor, and I believe that that's going to be the um, case study that's coming up a little bit. But these are things that we can do to keep the species going. So we'll try to raise them in captivity, maybe release them later. Um, into the wild uh, when we feel that they're able to do that. And uh, so we've been making a lot of efforts in this area too. It's costly and um, it's uh, a lot of it is trial and error too, trying to figure out how it can be done. And uh, But we are doing these kind of things. Okay, and here's what I'm saying about the idea of the uh, controversy too for the zoos. 
All right. And what can you do? Well, don't buy fur or ivory. That would be a good one if they're endangered species. Don't buy products. They have a lot of certification now that goes on with uh, paper products or products from wood that say they were sustainably harvested. So you can look for those kind of uh, uh, products to buy. Vote with your pocketbook. Vote with your dollars. Um, don't buy species that were taken for the water uh, from the wild and uh, be educated about what's going on. All right, here's the condor that I was talking about. So we did a uh, captured and breed, bred them in captivity and uh, then released them into the wild, so that was pretty uh, effective. And then we found out that they were dying in the wild again because of the lead poisoning. They would eat things like uh, lead pellets from shotguns. So now there's uh, movement now to keep the lead out of the... Um, the lead out of the shotgun pellets. Oh, you got to check out pictures of condors. They are the world's largest flying bird and they're amazing wind span, uh, spans, wingspans. So check those out when you get a chance. Oh, there's one now. Look at that. That's a pretty big bird. I forgot I had put that picture in there. Yeah, that's just, that's majestic. The world's largest flying bird. Okay, so uh, again, we're back to the precautionary principle. Before we're getting rid of areas or getting rid of species, we should know what they are all about. And um, yeah, that's the idea of the precautionary principle as well. So you can decide whether you agree with that or not. And that is the end of this chapter. Thank you very much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you back in class.